Wow, what a privilege to be here. Um, it's a privilege to come up, share my heart, um, share what I think the Lord's put on my heart for you all. Uh, for those that don't know me, uh, my name's Pritt, together with my wife, T, who's got the bright red hair. It's, it, it will probably be a different colour next week, maybe. Who knows? Who knows? Um, but we are launching Verso Hemel. Yes. In a few weeks' time. So please, um, please do pray for us. <laughs> um, but yeah, we've been with you guys since Easter. And I guess just, just from, from my wife and I, we just want to say a huge thank you to you all, um, to everyone who's come up to us and encouraged us, to, to everyone who's said hi and prayed for us. Um, we just felt so, so welcomed. No, not, not just welcome to, to this church, but actually for us, we, we feel welcomed into a family, and that's really special. So, so thank you all. Um, right, well, that's the mushy stuff out of the way. Um, so, I'm going to start off by talking about the greatest trilogy, the greatest film trilogy the world has ever seen, which is, of course, Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings, yes, it's Lord of the Rings. If you said Star Wars... Come and get prayer. It's fine. Um, the greatest trilogy, Lord of the Rings. So there's this scene um, in the Fellowship of the Ring, in the first one. It's the Council of Elrond in Rivendell. So it's this beautiful place, and all the greatest warriors in the land have gathered. You know, you've got, you've got um, Aragorn, uh, the heir to the throne of Gondor. You've got Boromir, the greatest warrior in Gondor. You've got Legolas, the greatest elf archer. You know, Gimli, the, one of the greatest dwarf warrior. And they're all, they're all talking about, okay, we need to destroy this ring. Someone needs to go to Mordor and destroy this ring. And so all these, all these men are like, test, with this testosterone fueled argument, are going, I'll do it, I'll do it. No, you can't do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. Um, and then, cutting through the noise, this tiny little hobbit called Frodo Baggins stands up. It's a beautiful scene. And he says, I will take the ring though I do not know the way, which is a line I just, I love. Because I love the heart to just lay everything down, to say, look, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm going to lay it down because there's this thing that needs to be done, and I will do it. I will go. See, I think many of us, we, we wait for this big call, right? We wait for this, this big mission. We see, we see stories in the Bible, don't we, of men and women laying down everything to pick up the call and go where God is sending us. Become a hero of faith. And I think for many of us, that moment can pass us by. Because we're looking around and we're going, no, God's going to send Legolas. Or God's going to send the Aragorns, you know. He's going to send the mighty warriors. And we just assume that, that he's going to send someone else and we disqualify ourselves. We miss out on the adventure of a lifetime. So before... Um, before we get back into our routine, we, we've hit September, haven't we? Some, I'd hate to say it, guys. Summer's over. We're back to routine. We're back to routine. So I want to spend a little bit of time looking at what happens when the Lord calls us. Um, and what are some of the lies that we might believe that can be a bit of a barrier to us and stop us from saying yes and stepping into what the Lord's calling us into? And as a bit of a Spoiler, we love spoilers, right? Um, I think it's the same thing that God's been saying to us throughout summer. Like, like God's been saying so much, hasn't he? But, but he's been saying he's with us. He's been saying he's with us. You know, he's the God who sees. He wants to do a work in us. He wants to work with us. He's got a heart of compassion and he's inviting us um, to, 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 to do that with him. He knows you and he wants to go deeper in relationship with you. So we're going to look at a very average Joe figure in the Bible, and we're going to look up when the Lord shows up and asks this question, am I not sending you? So can I invite you to turn to Judges 6, and we're going to start in verse 11. And just while you're, you're getting that up, um, let me give you some context. So the Israelites have turned their back on the Lord. And the Lord's given them into the hands of the Midianites. Um, and the Midianites have been oppressing the Israelites for seven years. Seven years. It's the Bible describes the Midianites like locusts. Every time that the Israelites plant something, the Midianites come and just ravage the land, destroy everything. Um, and it's, it's, it's terrible. It's hard for the Israelites. So much so 
They cry out to the Lord for help. And this is a cycle we see throughout the book of Judges that the Israelites turn their back from the Lord and things don't go well. <laughs> and then they cry out to the Lord for help. So let's look at what happens when God calls an unlikely hero, Gideon. So Judges 6, verse 11 says this. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak of Ophrah that belonged to Joash, the Abias right, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Why don't you just turn to the person next to you and say, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Love it. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did the Lord not bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon said. But how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my family. So the Lord calls Gideon, and what we see is Gideon resisting the call. Um, and I think something that's important to note, Gideon's clearly not satisfied with the state of the nation. Like, he's not happy with, with how things are. He wants to see something change. He's desperate for it. And when the Lord shows up, his immediate response is, Lord, I, I want you to change things, but, but you can't use me. You can't use someone else. You can't use me. So why? Why, why is that? Um, I'm going to talk about three lies that I think um, Gideon's believing here. Because I think these are so dangerous. I think they're so prominent. I think they're lies that maybe some of us in this room are grappling with even today. So, lie number one that we catch Gideon believing here is this. I need to hide. I need to hide. Okay, so we find Gideon threshing wheat in a wine press, and, and the writer of Judges deems this actually an important detail to note. Um, so, the process of threshing wheat, essentially what they'd do is they'd, um, they'd, they'd throw it up in the air, and the wind would blow away all the chaff, so you'd get, you know, you'd separate the chaff from the grain. Um, so you need, you need a, typically it would be in a large open space where you'd get a nice breeze, right? A wine press, on the other hand, is like a small walled place where you can, you know, you, they used to stamp on the grapes and all the juice would kind of flow down. So it's nice and walled. So I'm not sure what kind of a breeze you'd get in a walled place, um, but, but, but it, you certainly wouldn't really get much wind. So threshing wheat in a place with no wind doesn't, doesn't really make sense. Um, and, okay, so I actually think that for thousands of years, I think preachers have come up to the pulpit and have given Gideon a bit of a hard time about threshing wheat in a wine press. Um, listen, listen, right? A wine press, it's the last place that you'd expect to catch someone threshing wheat. And of course, the Midianites are just ravaging everything. Like, as a tactic to hide from the enemy, like, as a tactic to hide from the Midianites. I mean, either it's genius or it's sheer stupidity. I, I'm not going to be. I'm not going to be the one to judge. Um, but regardless, we catch Gideon believing this lie. That I need to hide, you know, and it's dictating his approach to life. In order to be successful, he needs to hide. That's what he. That's what he believes. If I want to produce crop successfully, I need to hide. If I want to be successful in my career, I need to hide can't do what I'm supposed to do out in the open, because if, if, I, if I'm out in the open, people will see me. The enemy will see me. I'm exposed. I'll get attacked. Think about this, right? I said that it's a detail that um, the writer of Judges includes, but it's not something, it's just the end of a sentence, right? Like, it's, it's, it seems kind of like, it's almost made out to be normal. And I wonder, maybe, was that how Gideon lived? Was that his routine? Um, his natural state, just hiding, afraid to step out into the open. 
Okay, I want to, con- I want to con- contrast this with um, David, all right? Because David had a similar moment where he, um, had to, he had to step out into the open. And so the open for him wasn't the threshing floor, but it was the Valley of Elah. And he had an enemy, didn't he? The enemy wasn't the Midianites. The enemy was an incredible giant <laughs> called Goliath. And this is what David says in 1 Samuel 17. This is what he says to, to that warrior, probably three times his size. He says, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day, I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, but the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. Wow. I mean, I just want to run outside now, right? David, come on. There's a difference there. Do you see it? There's a difference here between David and and Gideon. David is running towards the enemy. Gideon's hiding. And it's a case of expectation. You see the expectation in what, in what David says. He expects, he expects the Lord to deliver him. Whereas Gideon has just lost all faith. So let me ask you, where's your expectation this morning? What's your expectation? Is there a place in your life where you're hiding? Do you need the Lord to help you have faith this morning? And for Gideon, I I think his lack of faith was largely driven um, by lie number two. So lie number one was I need to hide. Lie number two is this lie. God isn't with us. God isn't with us. That's a lie. In verse 13, Gideon says, pardon me, my Lord, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did the Lord not bring us out of up of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. So here it is. Gideon doesn't believe the Lord is with the Israelites. He's looking at his circumstances and all that's going wrong and is convinced that God just doesn't care and has abandoned them. Um, now, we know that's not how God operates. We know um, that's, that's not who, who God is. But it's so easy for us to believe that lie, isn't it? Okay, have you, anyone in this room, have you ever met someone who just always seems to be rubbing shoulders uh, with celebrities? Like, like, they just always seem to have met this person or bumped into this person. So I, I, I used to know, so someone I used to work with, it, it seemed like everyone she went to school with is now famous. Um, <laughs> She, she, her family seems to just know every A, B, C list celebrity there is. Um, in fact, one morning, one morning she comes in and she just casually, as if it's the most normal thing, is like, yeah, no, this morning I bumped into Kira Knightley. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if you know anyone like that. Because for me, part of me is like, wow, that's so cool. And then, then the other part of me is like, why does this never happen to me? Like, why can't I bump into David Beckham? Well, I don't know. I might have said David Beckham, weird. Anyway, um, <laughs> you know, I, know z- I, I, don't, I don't know any famous people. I think I've got a few, a few friends who've got like over a thousand followers on Instagram. I don't know if that counts as famous, but, um, but look, we do that with God, don't we, sometimes, right? Do we? Do we? Like, like we hear these amazing testimonies, these just stories of, of profound encounter and God doing miraculous stuff. And part of us, I think, is like, wow, that's amazing, wow. But I think sometimes part of us, we go, oh, that's amazing that that, that God works through them. That's amazing God shows up for them. But he doesn't doesn't show up for me. He does for them, but he doesn't for me. He's with them, but he's not with me. And this is what Gideon's doing. He's saying, we've heard the stories. You were with our ancestors. You delivered them out of Egypt, but you're not with us. You're not with us. You were with them, but you're not with us. 
Because he was stuck looking at his surroundings and his circumstances as an indication of whether God was with him or not. Is that how, is that how we gauge the presence of God? Do we look at our surroundings? Oh, things are going well. God must be with us. Oh, things aren't going so well. well God must have left us. Is that how we do it? How many of us have looked around our nation, our town, and we've just felt hopeless? You know, God, where are you? It, sh- it shouldn't be this hard. When my, um, when my granddad died a few years ago, this is pre-COVID, um, it was just before my mum was having an operation. And what it meant for her was that she'd, she'd miss church. Um, right when she needed it most, yeah? So I had this bright idea. Oh, mum, why don't we do church at home? To like, you know, get some songs out, we'll sing some, we'll do some worship together, you know. And, um, and I just felt the Lord say, you should invite all your cousins. Were none, none of whom are Christian. Um, and I was like, oh, that's a great idea. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I sent this like feeble, <laughs> this feeble text message around. Like, hey, you guys, you, you could come. I mean, we're, we're doing this thing. You could come, you come if you want. You know, no, no pressure. You don't have to. I mean, yeah, come, come along. Um, and then the night before, it was like, God was like, no, 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 come on. Like, invite your cousins. So I sent... A, a bit more of an intentional <laughs> text message, let's say. And I didn't hear anything back. And I was, happy, I was, I was actually I was at peace with that. I was at peace. Um, <laughs> until, until maybe a couple of hours before um, said time, uh, when one of my cousins texted back and went, yeah, so just so you know, I don't know if anyone's text, but we're all coming, all of us. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I was like, oh, Lord, that's great, but... Oh, but um, I don't think any of them have even heard me sing before. Like, this, like, God, like, God, you're going to have to show up. Like, you're going to have to show up and do something. Because if you don't, it's going to be so awkward. Like, I mean, like, the fact they never heard me sing, but also, like, just singing these songs, like, they've never heard before. They're like, you know, like, oh, Lord, would you come? Like, you know, like, you know. So I was like, this is going to be embarrassing. Um, just a quick reminder, um, T and I, your Versa Hemel site pastors, we're, we're going out in a couple of weeks. Um, so, uh, yes. Um, uh, and it was like God said back to me in that moment. It was like, I'll show up. Will you? Wow. Let me tell you this. God was there. God was there. It was a lesson that I'll never forget. Okay. Here's the crazy thing for Gideon, all right? Um, he doesn't even realize that he's speaking to the angel of the Lord. Like, read, read on, read on, read verse 22, because verse 22 is the moment when he realizes. <laughs> um, so at this point, he doesn't realize he's speaking to the angel of the Lord. And, and um, if you were here a few weeks ago, Jenna was here. Uh, she was talking about the angel of the Lord. Like, this is Jesus in the Old Testament. Gideon doesn't even realize that he's... He's, he doesn't even recognize Jesus when he's speaking to him. Like, like do you understand how hilarious that is? this is, right? Gideon is being, is he, he's like, yeah, God's not here. As he's speaking to Jesus. Like, God's not here. God's not here. You know, it's, it's, it's incredible. But you see, Jesus was changing his heart just like he does with us today. You know, so often we pray about God showing up in a certain situation or a certain town. Actually, God's already there. God's already there. But what he's doing is he's changing our hearts and he's sending us. So, in that process of God changing our hearts, we can often battle with lie number three. The lie number one, I need to hide. Lie number two, God isn't with us. Lie number three, God can't use me. God can't use me. Verse 15 says, pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my family. Okay, the Bible is full of moments that I find hilarious, because do you do this? Like, you're looking at a particular character, and you're like, man, you are so stupid. You are so, what are you talking about? And then as soon as you have that thought, 
you, it's, like, it's like the Lord goes, no, but you can, do you not see yourself in this person? <laughs> and this is, this is a moment like that for me because the angel of the Lord shows up, like Jesus himself, and he calls Gideon a mighty warrior. And Gideon's like, um, you got the wrong number. You, you just, that's not who I am. <laughs> um, all right, have you ever had a child come up to you um, and they've drawn a picture? And this, by the way, this would be none of your kids. I'm talking about other kids, because all, all your kids, I'm sure, are artists at birth. But I'm talking about other kids, right? Have you ever had um, a kid come up to you and show you a picture? And you're like, oh, wow, it's, it's so good. And you're trying to, in your mind, you're trying to work out, is it their mummy? Is it a giraffe? Don't know. <laughs> Let's just encourage them as we go. And, um, and, but there's sometimes, right, sometimes, they come, up, they come to you this picture, and you're like, whoa, this is actually, that's actually, oh, that's really good. You're like, wow, that's a really beautiful butterfly. Wow, well done. And then they're like, butterfly? <laughs> it's a spaceship. And you're, and you're like, you're like, you squint a bit, you like turn your heads, and you, you're looking at this butterfly, and you're like, oh, wow, what a lovely, what a lovely spaceship you've drawn. <laughs> okay, here's the thing. They created it, Yeah? So, if the creator says it's a spaceship, doesn't matter how much it looks like a butterfly, it's a spaceship. You know, some of us in this room have believed that we are something just because that's what we think we look like right now. But God is our creator. So, We are who he says we are, not who anyone else says we are. We are who he says we are. Now, let me tell you what his word says about who you are. I'm going to read from Romans 8, starting in verse 14. It says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. You are a son or a daughter of God. You are a co-heir with Christ, which means God can and will use you. God is with you, mighty warrior. Man, I wish Gideon could have read Romans 8. He says, you don't understand. I'm the weakest of the weakest. I'm the lowest of the lows. You don't know how scared I am, how feeble I am. Look at me. I'm hiding in a wine press. Use someone else, God, because you... You can't use me. I haven't got it in me. Okay, I actually relate to Gideon here. Because, you see, I, I see me all the time. Yeah? Like, I see me at my worst. I see me at my weakest. But what I'm doing when I, when, I, when I say that with that mindset is the same thing Gideon's doing. It's the same thing the world does. We're defining who we are and what we're capable of based on our, our outward appearance. And of course, in 1 Samuel 16, 7, it says, the Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So when he says, mighty warrior, that's the potential God sees in Gideon in the future that he's inviting him to step into. See, Gideon can't see it, but God can. You know, you might not see it today, but God sees it. You know, what's the Lord saying to you today? Maybe there's a moment where some of us, we just need to ask, Lord, what are you calling me into? Because maybe it's, maybe it's not to be a mighty warrior, right? Maybe it's to be a foster parent. And you might say, but Lord, I'm not even a parent. You know, I'm, I'm not the right person for the job. But God knows you better than you know yourself. Could this be a story that he's inviting you to step into? You know, maybe he's calling you to be a teacher. Lord, I couldn't possibly. Hey, kids. (laughs) A 
business leader. But Lord, I don't know the first thing about business. Here's the thing. God loves working with his people. Can I be a nerd for like a second? Is that all right? Um, if anyone's got your Bible, turn to Romans 8, 28 for me. All right? And then... Um, I'm sure some of you won't need to turn, or some of you, some of you will know it off by heart because it might be on your fridge. This is the verse that says, you know, and we know in all things uh, the Lord works for the good of those who are called, um, who love him and are called according to his purpose, all right? Um, but if you've got it open in your Bible in front of you, um, some of you, you'll, you'll see a little footnote, right? Like there's a little number next to it. Um, and in, in, if you read the footnote in my Bible, um, it, it says, or in all things... God works together with those who love him to bring about what is good. Let me say that again. In all things, God works together with those who love him to bring about what is good. Look, the truth is, there's biblical principles. Both are true, right? And if you want, if you want proof of, of, God, um, of God working together with people, just read Hebrews 11. Like, it's just story after story after story of God partnering with, with, as we call them, the heroes of faith, those that have chosen to have faith in God. And what he did then, what he did with those people, he does today, now, with you and with me. So we grapple with these three lies. I need to hide. God isn't with us. God can't use me. And with all of these, there's a call to have faith, right? Like, Gideon asked this question, how can I save Israel? You know, I think the Lord answers this in two parts, both before Gideon asked that question and after. So the first thing he says is, go in the strength that you have. And I think this is the key point here, right? Like, God's just asking Gideon to give what he has. Sometimes we forget that God works with us. It's not us versus the enemy, right? It's God plus us versus the enemy. You know, Gideon alone, he's right. He alone, he doesn't, he doesn't have enough about him to defeat a whole Midian army. But I think God can and does use a small and weak Gideon to save a nation. He can and does use a Frodo Baggins that's brave enough to say, I will go, humble enough to say, though I do not know the way. You know, let's not get hung up on what we don't have. Let's give the Lord what we do have. You know, there was a little boy that brought lunch for one, and he gave it to Jesus. And Jesus fed 5,000. You know, the, in the parable of the talents, the guy that got three talents, he didn't go, well, you gave Trevor five talents. Why, why have I only got three? No, he took the three that the Lord had given him. And he used it. So go in the strength you have. And then secondly, the Lord says, actually in, in verse um, 16, the Lord says to Gideon, I will be with you and you will strike down the Midianites, leaving none alive. You know, I think, I think the Lord does something that's kind of countercultural to what we would do. You see, you see if I was... If I had seen Gideon just after this, and he was telling me, oh, you'll never guess what happened. This guy came up to me and said, I'm a mighty warrior. And he said, you're going to save the Midianites. I'd be like, you know, I'd be like, and, you know, and Gideon's saying, oh, but I'm the weakest of the weakest. I'd be like, no, 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 no. Gideon, you got it all wrong. You're not the weakest. You know, your family's not that bad. You know, like, you're stronger than your brother. You know, you could have him. Like, you know, look, remember that time you were threshing wheat in a wine press? That was so clever. You're brilliant. Amazing. You got this. Because it's, you know, it's being encouraging, right? Like that's what we do. But that's not what the Lord's doing here. He's not building up Gideon's self-confidence. He's assuring him and reminding him that God is with him. It's not about Gideon's self-confidence. It's about his God confidence. Like, this is a man who's endured seven long years and he's lost his faith. You know, there's some in this room, we've been enduring something for a long time and we're losing faith. I want to tell you that God is with you. 
So let's come back to this question. The, the title of this talk, where the Lord says, am I not sending you? Okay, so we're being sent. God is with us. And I love that the Lord shows up to Gideon just in his day-to-day -day business, you know. So as we move into this new school year, you know, what? we step into our day-to-day, -day, the same place in which Jesus would later approach James and John, Simon Peter, Matthew, and a whole host of others, and call them into a life of mission. We examine our hearts and ask, whether we're ready for Jesus to interrupt our day to day. Like, like to go where he sends us, to be disrupted, to stand out in the open, boldly declare the gospel, to declare that God loves men and women around us, to people that have never heard it. You know, are we willing to go? Whether that's the mountains of Nepal, or the school gates in Hemel Hempstead or St. Albans. Are we willing to go? Like, that's the Great Commission, isn't it? You know, to, to go and make disciples of all nations. But let's not forget what it's underpinned by. The last line, Jesus says, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You know, we go knowing that he's with us. So you do not need to hide. God is with you. And he can, and he will use you if you let him. You know, this Great Commission, it's not expired. It hasn't expired. It's still the mission today, you know? And we're, we have a renewed focus on mission here at, at Verso and, and in St. Albans. You guys are going to be unpacking this in the coming months. Um, a, a few, not long ago, a few of us went to the Send at Wembley, where thousands in this country were stirred up to say, yes, here I am, Lord, send me. God is sending people in our time, in our day. Should we stand?